Welcome to the CFA Connections How-To Tutorial on Wine Pairings. This tutorial is presented by a corporate flight attendant and sommelier, Megan, who is known as the Fox in Flight. And so now here's Megan. My name is Megan. I, um, with the Fox in Flight, I am an in-flight sommelier and I've been trained through the Court of Master Sommeliers and WESIT. I just finished my WESIT Level 3. Um, and I am working towards my level two sommelier with the Court of Masters. Um, I've been in wine pretty much my entire life. I was very lucky and my parents actually have a vineyard down in Italy uh, that we went to every summer. My uncle owns a winery. And so ever since I was a little girl, wine has always played a big part of my life. Grew up in Europe. So, yep, we started having wine at about six years old at the dinner table. Probably explains a couple things wrong with me. Um, but besides that, it's just, I've grown to love it. It's become such a big part of my life. I'm a big history nerd. So I love the history behind wines and how each wine can tell a story about different vineyards, different, um, appellations, even the winery itself, they all have their own individual characteristics. And so that's something I've liked to always delve further into. You need as much help as you can get with flavor profile, because it can be an absolutely fantastic wine on the ground. However, there was actually a study, um, I researched this, I was um, by Lufthansa, and it's saying that um, your perception, taste bud sensitivity to saltiness and sweetness diminishes by about 30% at altitude. So that's really going to affect those flavor profiles in the wine. Granted, it, they'll still be there. It's a high quality wine, but you just have to keep that in mind when you're serving a wine. Make sure you give that wine every possible chance that you can give it to make sure it's a good quality, give it a good, kind of again, spending more money on wines there will really help because if you're serving a $10 bottle of wine, um, shame on you, if you're serving a $10 bottle of wine on a multi-million dollar jet, but I get it sometimes, um, maybe that's all they wanted. If you do, you have a higher chance of having a really good pairing and a really good reaction if you do have a high quality wine to begin with and you've given it, even those, those extra five to miss breathe. The number one thing, if anyone gets anything from this is do not pair, do follow that old antage of red wine to red meat, white wine to white meat. That is exceedingly outdated. And for example, let's take a chicken breast. That is the cotton ball of meats, essentially. It's just existing. Well, think of how many different ways you can prepare a chicken breast. I'm not going to pair the same wine with a grilled chicken and roast vegetables than I am with a, uh, let's say a blackened chicken or even a chicken with a mushroom cream sauce on top of it. Those are all, you want to pair to the preparation and the sauce. You do not want to pair just to the meat itself. Cause again, meats can be cooked and paired so many different ways. Um, and so again, if you want to like do the pairing things too, is you, there's three different mentalities that you can do with wine pairings. Um, the easiest one is regionalism. So that's that old antage, what grows together, goes together. I'm going to do a nice Chianti or Sangiovese with a nice tomato sauce, pasta. Um, that's a really good, safe option. So if you're not quite confident on your pairing abilities yet, um, just stick with that. It's good. You'll get points for trying, even if it's not hundred percent perfect. And a lot of people really overthink their pairings. Um, put it this way, one really good meal has never been ruined by a non-perfect pairing. Like it's always, it hasn't ever, you haven't ever ruined a meal that way. I mean, it can make the wine not taste too good and not be perfect, but you're not going to have somebody be Okay, no, entirely. Well, you might. Sorry, You're never gonna have someone. We never know what's gonna be fun. So you should not have someone who's going to sit there, sit back, and say they refuse to eat your meal just because the wine isn't quite perfectly paired. So if you're not confident, just stay with what the grows together goes together. You're not gonna get any spectacular wow taste buds results, really but you're good. You're safe. That's a very safe option. So if you're new, you're not quite confident, grows together, goes together. Just stick with that. Now there's another form, which is complementing. So you want wine and your food to complement each other. So for example, so there's different reactions that food and wine can have together. So let's start with 
salty food. Think oysters or um, really salty cheeses, anything along those lines. You're going to want, it's going to make your wine seem a lot more fruity and less dry. So you don't want to already start with a fruity wine that's already not that dry because then it's just really going to almost taste like syrup on your palate. So you've got to play that down a bit and kind of, they have inverse reactions, food and wine. So my favorite thing to pair with is honestly champagne, like champagne and oysters has always been a great pairing for a reason. Um, popcorn and champagne even. If you think about that really salty foods and cheeses, anchovies, Caesar salad actually goes really good with champagne too, because that dressing is super salty on it. And because that champagne is there and the champagne's already very high acidity, it's already dry. It's fruity, but it's not like bright in your face, um, like chewing on a tropical fruit. It will really balance that out. So it'll make that fruitiness come forward. It'll balance out the drying of the champagne on your tongue. And it just really, they work very, very well together. Now, sweet, on the other hand, if you have a sweet food, so desserts, anything along that line, the wine must always be sweeter than the dessert you're serving. That, that's one that actually really needs to be stuck by because if you are serving a dessert that's sweeter than your um, wine, it's going to make your wine seem dry. It's going to make your, uh, it's going to make your wine seem dry. It's just really not going to make it, the fruitiness is going to kind of go away. It's going to really contrast each other on your palate. So, um, and not in the good contrast way, because that's another pairing method you can do, but we won't get into that. That's a little bit more you really got to know your wines if you're going to try to do a contrasting um, pairing there, which they can come out really, really well. But again, you really got to play it safe and know your wines if you're going to try to do a contrasting pairing. So again, complementing and regionalism is the great one. So you have dessert wines. That's why dessert wines are so sweet. Think of Insanto, a sweet port, like a tawny port. Those are very sweet wines. And um Typically they're served a lot like very small glasses. Actually, I have one here. So typically dessert wine glasses are very, very small. You most likely won't have these on an airplane. Um, so ways you can serve them. Typically there are at least two wine size, wine glass sizes on board an aircraft. So we'll just use these exaggerated examples here. So if you have two different sizes, um, use the smaller one and then make sure you actually stay below that curve of the apex in there because you don't want to overpower someone with those fort a fortified wine or a dessert wine. Very sweet, very syrupy. Um, it's not really something someone's going to want to enjoy with a meal. It's very small amounts like dessert. You don't go overboard with dessert. Typically desserts are small and petite. Keep your wine portions the same when it goes to that. So again, that complimenting, you want your portion. I guess we can go on that too. Your portion of food should match the portion of wine that you're going to serve. Um, so small dishes, little bits of wine or lighter bodied wines. You don't want to serve, again, thing of port like this with a tiny little piece of chocolate dessert, for example. It's going to really throw, I mean, hey, maybe they like that and good for them. I mean, if you can handle that, that's, that's great. Ooh. I love dessert wines, but I can only do a couple sips. Um, okay. So then bitter food. Um, this is one that's kind of hard to describe, but think of like radicchio, for example, that really bitter, crunchy kind of food. Uh, it's usually more in vegetables than you'd really get in anything else. And so it's not really a common pairing that you would have to do. Um, you just need to remember, but I guess if you have something that's charred as well, if you have char marks, that's a little, that's a bitter taste to it. You're going to want a lighter tannin wine. So something that's not quite as heavy in tannin because that tannin also has that astringency effect on your palate that dries it out and it tastes bitter. So you don't want to do a bitter wine with a bitter food. And then it's just, that, that, that's not very nice. And it, Really, they're going to be asking for like ice cubes and water to suck down at that point to make your mouth feel extremely dry. A good one for that. So if I would say honestly, no tannin if you can with that, or if they really want a red wine, stick with a lighter bodied red wine. 
Um, Pinot Noir is a great one for that. Um, you can do red burgundies as well. We'll get into those a little bit later. And um, yeah, just really make sure that there's no high tannins in something that you're gonna try to serve that's charred or um, even grilled marks. They can leave a little bit of that um, bitterness on there. If it's just like a light marking on the steak, for example, that don't, even, don't worry about that. Then start pairing it into your preparation and what you're gonna, if you're gonna sauce it or if you're just gonna leave it plain by itself. Okay, tart and tangy. So this is where, think of those uh, tangy cheeses like goat cheese or vinaigrettes, um, especially like a citrus vinaigrette, any like, so there you can think of like a lemon sauce on a fish, for example. It's gonna make your wine seem sweeter and less dry. So it's a good reaction. You just wanna pair that with a high acid wine. So, but again, make sure your food is higher acid than what your wine that you're gonna serve. Because if you have a super, super acidic wine and a super, super acidic food, again, it's gonna have that same reaction as those tannins. However, a big common pairing with this is Sancerre. So that is a French Sauvignon Blanc. Um, that's great with goat cheese. It's one of those ones, they both have the high acid, but they're not overpowering each other because the acid in the wine is gonna cut the acid of the food of the goat cheese. Um, but it's not exactly something you'd wanna serve with. Um, the acid can also kind of cut food. Oh, there's so many you can do things with Sancerre. It's one of my favorite wines. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, yeah, that's a really good wine. Now I'm trying, I'm just gonna say fatty foods too. I can go ahead and I'll get to fatty foods in a minute. So yeah, tart, tangy, get a high acid, zippy wine to go with um, Verdejo, Vino Verde, all of those are good options. All right, spicy food. So typically we're not really serving that many, like and this is spicy as in like temperature hot. Um, maybe you are serving that on the pie. Some, usually it's, we play it a little bit more safe, but sometimes you will be serving anything um, along the lines that's like the spicy curry, for example, anything along that. Any kind of heat from that food is actually going to accentuate the alcohol in the wine. So it's gonna make it, it's kind of a, it's one of those more difficult pairings um, and you don't want it to be super dry as well because if you have, if all you're getting is alcohol when you're sipping that wine, it's gonna burn the nostrils. You're not gonna get any of the flavor profiles of that wine. It's gonna feel like sipping on jet fuel. Um, so don't, yeah, that's one of those ones and off dry is what I'm going to go for like this little bit sweeter, not quite as drying on the palate because that sweetness will kind of counteract that high alcohol content and it'll mute the extreme spiciness of that food if that's what you're serving. So yeah, off dry, lower alcohol content. There's a couple wines I had listed on that, um, chart, like a Haltrock and Riesling, a Vude, a all of those would be good pairings for that. But again, with Riesling too, you need to make sure you're actually reading the label on that one because there's a lot of different, there's, there's seven different ca categories for Riesling. So read the label. <laughs> um, another one is what the umami. So this one is also a notorious difficult pairing because there's a lot of things that um, umami does. It makes your wine seem more bitter. It makes it seem less fruity and more drying. So you're gonna wanna start with a wine that's already high in those categories, because if you eat the umami, it's gonna kind of bring the sweetness down. It'll, if you have a sweet, fruity-ish wine, it'll bring it down a little bit more. So it's a little bit more on par with the umami flavors. You wanna pair that, yeah, low in tannin, high in acidity. Again, that bitterness, if you have something that is going to be like an umami wine, a bitter wine, anything that's going to already be dry on your palate. And if you're eating it with the food, that's also going to be drying on your palate. You're just, it's going to kind of just make everything dry. That's all you're going to focus on. They're not going to get any of the fruitiness. They're not going to enjoy the meal. It's just really going to, I mean, that bitter flavor, we all know what it is when you chew on something that's like burnt too long or been cooked too long. And it just kind of on the sides of your mouth, just really dries it out. It's not a pleasant experience. It's not something that's fun. So that's one of the things you pretty much want to avoid. Um, my favorite pairings are actually with fatty, oily foods, creamy stuff. I love cheese. I love anything with dairy and it's my favorite thing. So really good. 
Um, high acid for that one. Acid is going to cut through that fat level. So it's going to make your food seem, say if you're having a really rich cream-based sauce, if you have a high acid wine, it's going to cut right through that. It's not going to make it seem as creamy and as heavy in your mouth. Um, it's going to a little bit more, it'll make the wine seem a bit more refreshing, if that makes sense. It makes, because the fatty oily is going to cut the acid in the wine, and then the acid in the wine is going to cut that fatty oily feeling in your mouth from the food. So kind of meets in the middle right there. It's great. I'll get back to Chardonnay milk. So I was gonna say like, there's another good one too. If you wanna really play with the buttery flavors, you can find a buttery Chardonnay and that's good too. But yeah, again, that's one of those pairings you gotta be careful with too. And you really gotta know your wine there. Otherwise it's gonna be chewing on a caramelized wood chip. <laughs> so highly flavored food. This is something that's going to be very herb heavy or very spiced. And there's a lot of things going on in that wine. If you do not have a wine that can stand up to the spice and that, again, not spice as in heat, but spices and herbs and seasonings. If you do not have a wine that can stand up to that, it's gonna be really overwhelmed and it's drinking water essentially. You're not gonna get any of those flavors. You're not gonna get any of the bouquet. You're not gonna get any of the primary, secondary, tertiary flavors of that wine because it's that food is just gonna completely overpower it and be like drinking water. Is it like, a, like like pestos and stuff like that? Where yeah, like pestos or herb crusted foods. Um, peppered yeah, foods, maybe? Peppered meats, like anything along those lines. So <laughs> that Shiraz, I have a pairing for that. <laughs> but no, that's a really good pairing for that because those wines, like anything with the Syrah in it or Shiraz, Syrah, um, it's the same grape varietal. It's just different parts of the world where it's produced. Um, those wines are known for being peppery and being spicy with those. Um, it's going to have the black pepper. It's going to have all the different baking spices in it, most likely from oak. If it spent, it should have spent time in oak. Um, I like to say should, because I keep getting stumped nowadays. It's like, I found like Cabernet the other day that was aged in a inert, uh, stainless steel vessel. Everything's changing now where it used to be like, oh no, it's always in oak, um, so they're, they're getting really creative out there, which is good. So great for palate expansions. If you're unsure about a wine and you haven't tried it before, um, so you don't know the flavor profiles of it, you get to do the fun homework and go buy a bottle of that wine. Again, you might not be buying a Hermitage, for example, it starts at around $200 a bottle, but next door is Crow Hermitage, which is literally... I think half a mile over from Hermitage, but you'll get a lot of the same flavor profiles as well. So you can kind of start understanding um, those wines more. Um, you'll never really extend your palate if you stick with the same tried and true wines that you go to. Um, so sometimes you have to be a little adventurous and go out there and you may not like it. And that's kind of one of those things. If you don't like it, you don't like it, but then you know you don't like this wine. Okay. Well, why don't you like this wine? Is it too bitter? Is it too acidic? Is it too sweet? And you can start recognizing those flavor profiles on the palate and start pinpointing. Okay. I don't like this wine because the diacetyl from the malactic fermentation is too buttery. If I'm having malactic fermentation, I want more of that yogurt, sour, sour cream kind of flavor in my mouth. I don't want the butter flavor. So you start learning which ones, okay, I like this more. I like that more. And it's still, again, it's malactic fermentation, but it's not going to be the same across the board. It comes in different areas. Like, so there's like Chablis, really, really big wine region in um, France. It's actually part of Burgundy, but it's not with the actual area of Burgundy. It's kind of off a little further North, um, Northwest. And it's, all they do is Chardonnay there. Uh, in order to be a Chablis, you have to be a Chardonnay. But you'll get some oaked, some unoaked. And if you do get the oaked, it's not going to be as buttery as a California Chardonnay, for example. It'll be more of that like sour um, yogurt kind of feeling in your mouth. It won't be, you'll still get the cream coming through, but it won't be as buttery, if that makes sense. And some people, like I'm personally not a huge fan of buttery Chardonnays. I don't I'm not, a, I just don't like them. And that's my palate. And some people absolutely love them. So if someone loves a buttery Chardonnay, go to California for that one. Napa is really well known for those buttery 
oaky Chardonnays. Um, I guess with U.S. wines too, you need to be very um, producer specific. We do not have a lot of those Appalachian controls that they have in Europe. So those Appalachian controls are kind of put into place because they want, one, there was a huge forgery going on with people saying this wine came from this area, blah, 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 um, charging an arm and a leg for it when it really didn't come from that area at all. So now there's the Appalachian control laws where it can go down to being as specific as this part of this vineyard can only be called this wine or this Hermitage, this hill is Hermitage. Anything outside of that is not Hermitage. It can't be called that's legally protected names, um, which is good because you'll get similar qualities across the board from that appellation. So if you have someone who likes the saint Million, well, maybe I don't have this one specific producer. Or I can't find this one specific producer that I usually stock or that I usually have or that this um, client requested, but I have found another Sans Million as well. And you know, it's going to have the same regulations. It's going to be the same grape varietals. It's going to have more often than not the same weather conditions growing there too. So the vines will be quite similar. Uh, the only differences you'll really get would be down to actual winemaking, um, the wine production process, which is more of those tertiary flavors, um, which that's where they come from is the winemaking process. So if you can find the same appellation, you're most likely more often than not gonna get the same general flavor profile. So if you have someone who, like I said, only wants one specific wine and you can't find that producer or you're out of the country and you're, you're very limited on what you can find, if you can at least find something within that region, it's gonna be quite similar. Usually everybody's pretty happy with that. Methods. Okay, so let's start from the very beginning, there are old world wines and there are new world wines. So your old world wines, continental Europe, essentially, that's all I can really say that that's going to be your old world wines. Um, new world wines are going to be anywhere, um, United States, South America, Australia, um, South Africa. Those are all going to be your new world wines. So anything essentially out, yeah, outside of the continental Europe is gonna be a new world wine. Old world wines are there. So old world wines, this comes again back down to the um, Appalachian controls. Each country has their own um, version of it. However, there are the same EU standards that kind of regulate it across the board. And then each country goes in further and calls things different. So we'll start with France because French do really good wine. Um, they kind of are the ones who started these uh, Premier Cru, Grand Cru, uh, ranking levels, the Appalachian controls. So with Burgundy, because I have Burgundies in front of me, we'll start there. Um, Burgundies, for example, the higher the quality of wine, the closer the tie to the land. So that's where these really specific regions, um, like Chablis, for example, has, it has regulations it has to go to. Chablis is controlled by certain laws and certain rules in Chablis. All the producers who want to have the name Chablis on their label have to follow these regulations. Um, and they can get down to as specific as when to water, when to harvest, uh, what you're allowed to spacing wise, what you're allowed to prune. Uh, they can get very, very, very specific. Um, there's some even, uh, forget the name of it but there's a couple there's one region where they uh, actually kind of lost a lot of their harvest in 2016 because there was a huge hail storm coming through and they weren't allowed to put nets up to protect their um grapes essentially so they have pretty much just watched their entire investment go downhill and sounds silly but i guess again that's how they keep those wines um regulated and controlled to make sure the quality is the same across the board. Um, now, yeah, with Burgundy, the closer the tied to the land, the close, the higher quality of the wine. There is a PGI, which is, so all, I could put it this way, all areas in Europe, they're either gonna be a PGI or a PDO. A PGI is a protected geographic indicator. A PDO is a protected designation of origin, so kind of the same, kind of different. 
Um, really what gets into it is the PGI is going to be a lower quality than a PDO. So a PGI for in France, for example, you're going to start with the IGP, which is the, forgive my French, uh, Indication de Geographique Protégé. Protégé? I'm terrible with French. I'm German. I, I speak German. I don't speak French. So, And then one of those qualifications is also a vin de pas, which is just kind of translates to like wine of the land. That's going to be like your very basic table wine. Um, very, very basic. So if you see a vin de pas or anything along those lines, you won't really see those outside of France. Honestly, uh, they don't export those. But if you're at a small cafe or something, you just get the house wine. It's most likely going to be a vin de pas. And then you get to the PDOs, protected designation origin. So that's when you're going to have your AOPs and your AOCs. Um, we're going to kind of stick with AOCs um, on your planes. Those are the highest quality that you can find outside of France. Um, this is the um, Appalachian origin control. So this means like, for example, this one. Doo -doo. So this is a re and this little abbreviation right here, the one ER, this is where it can get kind of confusing with the French because they didn't make it easy on anybody. Um, one ER is premier, but there's also grand. And now if you just lose a trend, like premier comes to first, so you subconsciously kind of think that's better than a grand, right? Wrong, it's switched. Um, premier is actually the designation below grand. Grand crew is going to be your tip top, very best, um, high quality, extremely good wine. Premier crews are also great too. It's going to essentially be like your first harvest um, is what it translates to is like grand is going to be the, say someone you're going to go through a vineyard, you're only going to pick the absolute best grapes off of this one. You're going to get the very best ones um, to make your grand cru. And again, there's only certain vineyards that are allowed to use a grand cru designation. Um, they have to apply for it. There's a huge process behind it. But Grand Cru, a lot of times, um, the average price of a uh, Burgundy Grand Cru is going to start over $200 US dollars at least. Um, Premier Cru, a little bit more attainable. Um, so that wine that I actually had in 2015, it was um, under $50. So affordable, you can find them. And it's a Premier, so it's still going to be great. It's going to be better than just a a Rui wine. I think that's how you say it. Are you a wine? Again, I can't pronounce French. Yeah. So Appalachian. Yep. Crew. And then reading that label too. So this one, it'll say on the wine underneath it, the control. So that's when you know it's coming from an AOC. Um, anything that's going to have a town designation, a in Burgundy, at least Bordeaux labeling is different. You're going to know that that's going to be a higher quality wine that you have. Um, so again, the closer the tie to the Appalachian and the land for Burgundy, there's a bunch of different ones. So if it's just a Burgundy, you're just going to see Bourgogne on the label. And that's kind of a wine from Burgundy, literally. That's all it is. Um, it's not going to have any of those Appalachians on there. And that can either be because the vineyard or the winemaker didn't want to follow certain controls for that Appalachian. They can't put it on their label then, but they can still put Bourgeon on there because it is still a wine and is from Burgundy. I do have a Bordeaux. Okay, so the difference, got into this one. This is a Saint-Emilion Grand Cru, right bank Bordeaux wine. Um, Bordeaux is kind of broken up into three areas. You're going to have left bank, right bank, and then entre du mer, which is kind of at the very bottom, right in between the two banks. So uh, left bank wines like Grave and everything, those are going to be more cab based. Anything that's going to be a uh, right bank wine is going to be more Merlot based. With Bordeaux labels, it's going to be um, the wine producer. So you'll find a lot of these uh, chateaus um, going throughout. They'll be labeled most likely by chateau, like you'll have Chateau Margaux, uh, really good expensive one so the closer the tie to the actual producer is going to be the higher quality wine there and the thing with producers there it's not so much the vineyard itself it's the actual producer who gets the crew ratings and they have a whole nother rating on top so 
French wine labeling kind of started getting messy with Napoleon. That's when it all started. There was the French inheritance law, which means your land had to be divided up equally among your male heirs because we women did not have any rights. So that's fine. Still kind of bitter about that. Um, this is like, well, I want to own the winery too. Like, why couldn't I get any land? <laughs> Married off.